share screen. There we go. Um, I hope you can all see my screen right now. Uh, and good. So at um, at Pippa, we believe that uh, a truly world class performing arts is inclusive of all times and circumstances. And our research has consistently shown that those with caring responsibilities struggle to progress or even continue in their careers in music, dance, opera and theatre, of course, once they become parents or carers. They regularly turn down work because of their caring responsibilities and they often self-select out of opportunities as they cannot see how to manage the work structures or the work demands with their caring related needs. On average, parents and carers also earn less than those without caring responsibilities, which makes securing child or elder care even more tricky besides having to find flexible and out of hours holiday weekend um, care. And many feel that they cannot sustain their careers in the arts once they become caregivers, and they therefore have to change their roles or they have to decide to leave the sector altogether. Women, Disabled parents and carers and those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are most affected. We have to remember that caring responsibilities cut across every other protected characteristics and are therefore a key element of the whole inclusion, diversity, equality and belonging agenda. The policies and working practices that we at PIPA advocate for and that we support performing arts organizations to actually implement through our programs are not only key for attracting and retaining parents and carers, but they are beneficial for any employee or freelancer who needs to manage their work and their life demands. Um, as we're very proud um, at PIPA to be joining the Arts Council's national portfolio this year as an IPSO, we are more than ever committed to continue to support performing arts organizations to deliver on the EDIB agenda and specifically on the investment principle of inclusion and relevance. If you have, if you are receiving or um, will be receiving any um, further funding from the Arts Council, these investment principles will become very, very um, uh, known to you. So we offer two support programs to the arts organizations. We offer the PIPA Foundation Program, which is an entry level uh, program that is designed particularly with um, smaller or mid-scale organizations or those who are resource strapped um, in mind to provide them with um, the knowledge and the tool uh, to embed key practices to become more inclusive and accessible. And then we also have our well-established charter program which offers performing arts organization a robust monitoring and framework, uh, monitoring and evaluation framework, which is something that the Arts Council is very keen on, um, to help review existing policies and practices, to then identify areas for development, and then support the implementation of change through an extensive toolkit, and also from the learning of our wide network of performing arts organizations who are already working with us towards best practice. So therefore, I'm really delighted to actually be joined today by, by, um, by four of our PIPA's current charter partners to hear about some of the practices um, that they are um, currently doing to make their organization more inclusive, accessible, and relevant. So um, with me today, um, we have Deborah Sawyer, the Deputy Executive Director of Mercury Theatre. She's also a freelance um, recruitment consultant and a PIPA trustee. Uh, we will be hearing from Lizzie Luxford, who is uh, the operations manager at um, Grey Eye Theatre, um, and she couldn't join us today. So um, after Deborah, we will be sharing um, a recording that she um, uh, recorded for us, which is fantastic. Um, also here today is uh, Robert Hasty, the artistic director of Sheffield Theatres and uh, Lindsay Alvis, the um, Executive Director and Joint CEO of Middle Child in Hull. And with me today is Matt Harper Hartcastle, our Programme Manager at PIPA, who will talk about um, a tool that we want to share with you um, today as well. 
Right. I think that's more than enough talking from me. Um, I'd love to hand you over to uh, Deborah now. Um, oh, no. Uh, I'm trying to switch up my... Um, Hmm. Uh, stop sharing. There we go. Um, sorry, Deborah. I'd like to share uh, to, to hand it over to you to talk about some of the work that you've been doing around policies at uh, Mercury Theatre. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, I am the deputy exec director at uh, the Mercury in Colchester. Um, as the deputy exec director, I have a key responsibility for HR for the organisation. Um, we're a 541 seat uh, with a studio theatre in the heart of Colchester. Um, we programme activity between 48 and 50 weeks of the year and we have a base of about 109 staff at the moment which is probably about 58 full-time equivalents. Um, that has its own ch uh, challenges but what we also recognise is that it's what I recognise it's harder for smaller organisations who don't have somebody who can lead specifically on HR, but also um, we have a lot of freelancers. I worked out yesterday, about 30% of our workforce on top of the 109 are freelancers. So it's, we rely quite heavily. And so for us, our freelancers are also um, included in our policies just as a matter of course. So yes, there are some eligibility criteria, but in the main, most of the suite of HR policies are, um, are uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Represent those um, freelancers as well. Um, we've always considered ourselves to be a family friendly organization. And it's really quite common to see most usually my daughter in the school holidays, the finance uh, assistant's daughter kind of hanging out somewhere in the building but also with some people coming back quite recently from maternity leave on a Monday and a Thursday you'll also find a playpen and a toddler in it in either in the office or sometimes in the office in the workshop uh, so we are very much a family-friendly organization and I'd say now we have a suite of policies that reflect that um, in 2018, we closed for a refurbishment. No, 2019, we closed for a refurbishment and reopened at the tail end of 2021. And so our policies hadn't really been reviewed since 2019. So we have just literally, I've had them signed off in November, just gone through a, re, a review of every one of our HR policies. And as anyone knows, HR policies aren't a barrel of laughs, really. They can be quite dull. Um, so part of the policy, part of the policy review was making them readable and making sure that staff felt they could engage with them. So we've done a lot of work around the language that we use and the readability of them, because they can be incredibly dull. Um, there's only so much you can write about uh, the whistleblowing policy to make it interesting, but it needs to be there. Um, so since lockdown, um, we've also recognised that staff priorities have changed. And so we've had to rewrite those policies with that in mind, but also in mind to the fact that we really want to retain staff. And so to retain the staff, we've had to look at those policies and ensure they are family friendly, they are carer friendly, and they are just generally clearer. So you know what to expect and we know what to expect of you. So we've really looked at the language of that. And part of looking at that language was looking at um, whether there was any gender bias that had been written into an old policy that hadn't been looked at since 2015. And I found a few of those. Um, and we've also had to look at what are the legal guidelines that have changed in recent years. Mm. So part of one of our big drivers, I think it's gonna go backwards a little minute. We had to work out why we were doing the policy review. One, yes, they were time to be reviewed. It was two years since they'd been looked at before. But two, we really wanted to ensure that actually we were an attractive place to work for both those people who were already living, working with us, but those who were to come. Because 
as I think Rob will agree, there is a real shortage at the moment of particular staff, particular, in particular sections. I mean, for us, it was technical staff and chefs. So we actually had to really make our organisation an attractive place for them to want to come and work at. Um, as Rob agreeing with me completely. Um, so that's why we have done the update. Um, what did we do? Well, some were legal uh, things had changed. So like in the whistleblowing policy, there was a change in the law. So I updated that and there was a law that was the, in fact, the Public Interest and Disclosure Act of 2013 uh, was withdrawn. So we had to take it out of the policy. But um, some were a review of language. We have several staff who identify as being non-binary. So where it's appropriate and pertinent, we change genders from he or she to they. Um, some, it made perfect sense to remain as she, but on others, they was more appealing. And there was also language such as sickness uh, was changed to either fitness to work or just in health, ill health, in order to make it inclusive of things like mental health absences. Um, we also updated our code of conduct um, and we made it clear, really clear, what we as an organisation and as a body and a body of employees expect from other employees. But also in lots of our policies made it really clear what the employee can expect of us as an organisation by way of support, by way of um, rights, by way of support and, and help. So things like with the health and safety policy, uh, how do we show that you have a responsibility as well as we have a responsibility to you? Um, but also clearly in our flexible working and home working policy, we made it really clear that yes, we will consider all requests, but in order to, to have your request uh, accepted, there were certain conditions that you would have to be able to fulfill within your organization, such as, do you have a safe and clear place to work when you're at home? Um, and an example of that is since rewriting this policy, I've had a member of staff whose circumstances changed and they need to be able to work from home three days a week. I've said yes to that, but one of the questions in the interview that we had and the meeting we had to discuss it was, do you have an appropriate setup? Now, for many people, they'll say yes, because we've been doing it in lockdown, but actually I've just moved. And so my circumstance and the setup I had when my previous house was different. So, and I know that they've just moved. So we just run through, do you have a good Wi-Fi connection? Do you, do you have a good seat to sit at? Do we need to provide any equipment for you to be able to work from home? So that's part of the two-way street. And that's one of the changes we've made. Um, one of the other changes we've looked at is our maternity and paternity. They used to be two separate policies. Um, but now we have a single maternity, paternity and adoption leave policy because we have some staff who um, have chosen to adopt and for that reason they don't have to go down a separate route, it's all part of the same policy. Um, and what, that's actually one of the policies we had to enhance in order to recruit a particular member of staff. So we made the enhancement for all of the team because they were, where they were had a much better maternity policy than where, than us. So we upped it from statutory in order to recruit, but also retain some other staff who I know were thinking about becoming parents in the future. Um, also within our absence policy, we've, uh, we've included a sabbatical option. So anybody who's, worked for a minimum of three years can actually take a sabbatical of up to six months. And we've made that across the board. So there are ways of making family friendly policies and care responsibility policies that are inclusive because somebody might go, actually, I want to go and write my book. 
and we've gone, okay, as long as you've worked for us for three years, we can arrange for you to have a period of time off. Um, so it's been a really interesting process and people have really engaged with the new policies already. Um, one of the key things that I've discovered in terms of policy changes is that we've got to look at how we how we communicated them to the staff, because it's all well and good having those staff available, um, those policies available, but how do we communicate? So we've made sure that they're available on our HR software, but also we use teams across the organization so that any member of staff can, you, can access them from their phone, from their computers at home, however they access um, the internet. So we've been, uh, and we've really seen that take up because in, we, actually issued a letter to all staff saying that the policies were available and within a month of that I've had three two requests for flexible learning and two conversations about maternity leave and how and paternity and particularly in paternity leave so um that's what we've done and I'm happy to answer questions at the end Anna thank you Deborah that's um that's great and I think it's it's just important to remember that policies are the, the sort of foundations of an organization and having them having them in, in place with the with the inclusive language and communicating them to what's actually available is so um so important for uh well for, for the whole discourse i suppose um to help people to access what they need um i will now um uh, hand over even though it is a recording uh to um to lizzie so uh lizzie laxford is the general manager of um gray eye theater and um she will talk about more about how gray eyes have supported her in her parenting journey as well as the importance of proactive and open communication so we'll um we'll try and start the video now Thank you, Fee. Hi, um, this feels super weird, just talking to myself in my kitchen. Uh, I'm Lizzie, I'm the director for the Theatre Company, um, and I'm one half of a two mum family. Um, Gray, I joined Pippa as charter partners last year, and they asked me to come and talk about uh, making our policies accessible for same sex couples um, and same sex families. Um, so my daughter has just turned one, um, which is mad. Um, my wife carried her, so for the purposes of this conversation, I'm the second parent. Um, and I took a mixture of um, shared parental leave and annual leave and paternity leave last year when she was first born. Uh, so the first thing that made my experience of parental leave a positive one and I think really the most important um is that I had a, a really I was able to have a really open dialogue with my boss we have a good working relationship um he knew early on that my wife was pregnant so we had lots of time to talk about what I wanted to do in terms of leave what the offer was from Grey Eye how it worked logistically and, and all that stuff um it didn't feel like a uh like an there wasn't awkwardness or anything stilted about that approach which was which was really nice um and another real positive is that there are notes on the top of the paternity leave policy um which acknowledged that it applied to the partner of a pregnant woman and that that partner might also be a woman um but that the statutory name for the leave is paternity and i i really appreciated that because i'm a lot of things to my to my child but paternal isn't isn't one of them um so it felt nice that that was uh, that that's already was already written down that it didn't have to feel. I know I've, I've got some friends who are two mom families and and they the second parent in that family was told, oh well, basically you're the dad, aren't you? So we'll just talk to you as though you're the dad. And I just think that's uh, close minded and uncomfortable. Um, I will say that there are there's still a ton of gendered phrasing in our policies. So part of our PIPA review is is me going through those and and taking out gendered gendered stuff that need to be there um, so that it's more accessible for inclusive of other LGBTQ people. Um, there's always work to do and work to work to improve. 
Um, so Grey Eye is a disabled led organization and we have always worked in a very flexible way. Um, so lots of the adaptions that we already do that are already available to employees are kind of parent friendly by by default. Um, so I think working with Pippa definitely aligns with working accessibly. Um, and most importantly, like I said, it's it, it's attitudinal. If your if your employer is open to having conversations about how they can enable you to work best, whether that's to do with access needs or caring responsibilities or because of other work that you do, um, then it's much easier to find the answers than if they're just kind of inflexible and not unapproachable. Um, so that that was just so positive. Um, and it's also, I think, it's relevant that because Grey Eye as an organization is used to thinking about the right terminology and what the right thing to say is and moving when terminology evolves, moving with that. Um, and being generally like a um, that all contributes to that attitude and, and it feeling more comfortable. Um, it's great as the only workplace where I have never had to come out. Like I've just been able to be and and uh, and that all adds up to a feeling of acceptance and uh, safety in asking for asking for things that you need. Um, I also now do condensed hours since returning to work. After my shared parental leave, I, I do condensed hours, which I made a request for flexible working before I went on leave. It was approved quickly. Again, it was a, uh, there's a statutory process that you have to follow, filling in the forms and stuff, but it was a conversation with my my boss rather than um, just a form, just a black and white process. Um, it was approved quickly and easily. And so I now do full-time hours over the course of four days. Um, which is amazing. It means that I have a better work life balance and crucially, we have one day less childcare to pay for, um, which means that it's actually affordable to, you know, it's financially worth carrying on working, particularly with without the traditional higher paid husband in um, that's a that's a really huge thing actually for us. Um, and Grey Eyes also continued to work with a, a hybrid working model. So I'm working from home today. I tend to do two days here and two days in the office. Um, and that's extremely useful in terms of parenting more equally too. It means that I'm not, uh, you know, gone before wake up and back after bath time, all of those sorts of things. Um, so I suppose in summary, um, the things that have worked best as a gay parent is having a supportive environment, good policies that I felt like included me, um, a financial offer that made shared parental leave actually viable. I know it's not everywhere. Um, and a really genuinely flexible attitude to working patterns. And I think all of those positives are also true for disabled parents. Um, well, all parents, but disabled parents and gay parents and any any parent who is less different from the 2.4 children average man and woman all of that business um that was a bit waffly but i think that's sort of the nutshell of it all um if anyone wants to chat in more detail please get in touch i'm much better at answering questions than i am just waffling um look forward to being in touch and have a lovely webinar thanks bye that was kind of a little bit short, um, but uh, I think it was great to hear from from Lizzie. Um, firstly, about the, the the intersectionality of care and responsibilities and how it does cut across, but also how important it is to take this more holistic approach to access and inclusion. Um, that it's not just one road, but it's a it's a myriad of different um, different offers that people can then take. Uh, and see how to make them fit for for themselves. Um, I will now hand you over to uh, Robert Hasty, the artistic director um, of Sheffield um, Theatres, uh, to talk a little bit more um, about um, how how they Sheffield Theatres starting to become more relevant to their um, communities and who obviously want to see themselves represented um, by becoming also more uh, family friendly. Um, Rob, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Rob Hasty. My pronouns are he/him. Um, I am a white man in 
uh, my mid forties uh, with a bald head. Uh, and I am artistic director at uh, Sheffield Theatres. Excuse me, um, Sheffield Theatres is uh, uh, three theatre spaces and uh, a, a range of other facilities that sit in the middle of the city of Sheffield um, with a total of about two and a half thousand seats uh, uh, per night to sell. Um, and we have a programme of produced and presented work across 52 weeks of the year. Um, and uh, a, a huge range of community participatory learning uh, offers as well uh, that go across um, across all of our spaces, across a variety of spaces outside of, this, of our uh, home and, um, and across the calendar year. Um, we are uh, really thrilled to be a partner with uh, Pippa and uh, thrilled to be uh, developing our relationship with Pippa as, as, as Pippa kind of uh, grows, becoming an IPSO over the next funding period. Uh, and include, uh, inclusion and relevance is absolutely top of my brain or front of my brain at the moment because we are, like lots of people I know, um, uh, engaged in finalising our Arts Council documentation for uh for the funding that we've that, that has just been announced and and having to get really specific about the the practices and the language that we use to describe our activity um uh, i'm going to talk uh, uh uh more about the the ways that we work with uh freelance employees um uh we've heard really brilliantly and eloquently about about the policies that are in place that affect all employees um, uh, like all arts organizations we employ in a wide variety of ways um, uh, and you know, that, that range from uh, those on a, on a permanent salaried contract to those who are um, freelancing for very short periods of time for us um, and uh, uh, those who are coming into the building on other people's contracts uh, uh, through touring work. So there's there's a there's a range of ways in which we engage, um, uh, in which we employ people or, or, or uh, host people employed by other people. Um, uh, we know, of course, it's been said here already that, that uh, caring responsibilities intersect with frequently compounded by other barriers exper experienced by those from communities or with protective characteristics that are um, uh, underrepresented in the industry and particularly in positions of influence in the industry and that's um, uh, that's a, a, a sort of key uh, a key factor in how we think about the ways that we uh, improve our in inclusion and relevance through um, uh, through the practices that I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, when we're talking about freelancers coming into the organisation, uh, we're talking about people, some, some people we might have worked with before, but people frequently new to the organisation, working for uh, a limited period on a contract. So people who aren't necessarily familiar with our policies might be familiar with policies in other places. Um, and so, of course, we are always talking to other organisations about uh, uh, ways we can learn from and standardise our policies so that um, uh, there is a uh, it doesn't feel like you're coming into a completely new environment where you don't understand what the, what your uh, rights and responsibilities are. Um, one of the the real privileges of working at Sheffield Theatres is that um, uh, people seem to like coming to work here. Uh, uh, actors like working on the stages. Um, people like working in the city, it's a very welcoming place. Um, and uh, we've just celebrated our 50th anniversary and we've learned uh, quite a lot through talking to people about what the, the theatres mean to them. Uh, and uh, it's one of the things that is that, that keeps coming up is that the, um, the, the work is the centre of, of what we do. Um, uh, learned quite a lot actually about the um, about the, how the architecture of the building encourages that, um, and 
that the, the for example the center the center of our stage center of the crucible stage is directly under the architectural center center of the building so uh, uh architecturally and um metaphorically if you like sort of structurally everything starts with the work and uh, uh and everything builds outward from that and supports that and so the question that we started asking and uh, that feels really key to working with freelancers uh, and it's a really simple question a really basic question uh, uh, to the extent that it feels quite um humbling when people tell us that they're not asked it um or haven't previously been asked it by us or in other places is what do you need to do your best work and this is uh, this is a question that we're increasingly uh, actively asking for pe of people at the first point of contact with them. What do you need to do your best work? Uh, recently, it was another uh, ongoing relationship that we have that will be sitting alongside Pippa in the next um, in the next few years is a relationship with Ramps on the Moon. Um, Ramps on the Moon is uh, uh, coming to the end of its uh, uh, period as a, um, a consortium of theatres working to improve representation for deaf and disabled artists working within the industry. Uh, and we produced a, uh, a show with Ramps on the Moon last year, um, Much Ado About Nothing, that we presented in The Crucible that I directed. And um, uh, uh, over the course of that, uh, that production, which then toured to uh, other venues around the country. Um, we worked with uh, a large number of people who identified as disabled in a variety of ways, with a variety of impairments. Uh, and the question, what do you need to do your best work, um, was often addressed very specifically by access riders that, 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 uh, that those uh, artists had prepared. Um, but what we discovered is that that question can't be asked clearly enough and can't be asked often enough. Uh, and that uh, the ways in which people answered that question made it very, the intersectionality that we've been talking about, it made that very clear, made it clear that it's not just about access. Um, and asking the question is vital. Uh, and it is incumbent on us as, all, as employing organizations, not only to ask it, but to keep asking it. And to encourage and empower people to answer it and to feel able and comfortable to talk to us about what they need uh, to, to answer the question when it hasn't been explicitly asked um, and, to, and to keep talking so that we normalize the practice of articulating our needs. Um, we normalize the practice of articulating our circumstances. And we, we one of the things that affects, um, that, that particularly seems to characterize people coming into the building to work on shows, specific shows, is there is, um, there's, there's, the, the show must go on mentality because is really, really powerful. And the, um, the, the sort of the collective team spirit, if you like, to create a piece of thing, a piece of work to make uh, to make a show um, carries everybody forward on a momentum that means that that question frequently doesn't get asked or is inconvenient to ask. Uh, or when it is asked, people, uh, people censor their responses to it um, or feel that they, that if they do really talk about what it is that they need to do their best work that um, they won't be listened to or they will be judged as being um, uh, as, as uh, uh, those needs being inconvenient to the completion of the task that we've all set ourselves. And so th the work that we're doing at the moment is, is how do we normalize talking about those things so that, that we're not, so that those attitudes are discouraged that are understood and sympathized with um, uh, we know why people might feel that, that answering that question is puts them in a compromised situation or is difficult or um, uh, uh, for any reason that, that, that they're not comfortable with so so 
we're looking at the ways in which our language and our discourse within the building can normalize um, all of those things and that's that uh, that impacts on all of our employees not just on um, not just on our, our freelance workforce but uh, of course uh, uh, across the, the people that we uh, we work with in uh, uh, in all the ways that we do um, I'm told that I'm at 10 minutes so I'm going to shut up now but um, thank you very much everybody for listening thank you Rob I think I think it is um, because there's so much within that isn't there that, um, that to normalize to normalize asking for what you need in order to perform your best is, is such a huge endeavor um, but it's the most important one really because what we hear over and over again especially from freelancers it is so hard to be the one who has to raise their hand and say actually um, I'm really sorry but I need to leave early or um, you know I, I might not be able to do Friday afternoon if it wasn't ask in advance if there wasn't an, an open attitude from an organization to say hey let's have a discussion in advance to hear what we how we can support you to um, you know to work with us so thank you very much for that I think that's um, very very insightful I um I'll hand you over now uh, to uh, Lindsay Lindsay Alvis um, the uh, executive director and John CEO of Middle Child um, who will talk a little bit more about um, some of the, the practices the family friendly practices that they have embedded in their organization um, and that have helped them to to grow into um well into the company that they are now so lindsay over to you thank you so much um so it's really lovely to join you today and um, join you all today um, as anna said my name is lindsay alvis i'm executive director and joint ceo of middle child theater and um, my pronouns are she her and i'm a white woman in my late 30s with shoulder length blonde hair wearing a blue jumper um, I'm a little bit nervous today. I've got a few notes, so I hope that's not going to be too distracting. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I um, had everything covered. Um, so I've been asked to talk to you today about how embedding family friendly practices and policies has made middle child grow and become more business resilient. Um, a few things about middle child. Um, we're a whole based company um, making gig theatre for a good night out with big ideas. Uh, we make work in the city of Hull and then we tour it around the country. We're a relatively young organisation um, of just over around 12 years old. Uh, we're founder-led and um, because of that we've kind of gone through an organic process of development. Um, we're quite small so we can be quite flexible and dynamic. Um, so how did this work start for us? Well, it really evolved over time. And um, when I started in 2018, we sort of had a supportive environment and um, occasionally had um, children in the office and that kind of thing. Um, but in 2019, um, quite significantly, two members of the core team, myself being one of them, had our babies a week apart, which was obviously quite significant for a small organisation. Um, we were also finding that a number of the founding members were having children and many of the freelancers we were working with were also going through this life change. Um, so it was all kind of happening at the same time. And then, of course, the pandemic happened, which brought many of these issues to the fore with people caring for their children at home. And we also um, really wanted to respond um, to the big freelancer report when it came out. Um, and to listen to kind of things that that report had raised and think about how middle child as an organization could respond to some of those challenges. And um, I'm not gonna list everything we've done, but we do have some brilliant blog posts on our website. So do um, have a look at the middle child's news section on our website. There's a piece that really kind of itemized everything. And um, there's also some first person accounts. Um, I wrote one when I returned to work um, from return to leave during the pandemic about kind of the experience of that. So there's lots of, of resources there to access. Um, so one of the biggest changes we made um, was we moved to the four day week. Um, when I returned from my first maternity leave in 2020 in the pandemic, um, Paul, our artistic director and I were really aware of the impact the pandemic was having on the team and the challenges we were all facing. I'd always worked four days for the organization um, and that was something that was supported when I started the role um, prior to me uh, having any uh, care and responsibilities. And we agreed to trial it for three months. Um, at the time we sort of, I think thought, you know, we'll give it a go. Um, 
uh, you know, it might just be that we need it for this period of time. It might not be something that we carry on um, forever, or it might be something that we look at going forward. But right now we just need to make a change. And um, we did it quite quickly and sort of set about a three month pilot. And um, three months turned to six, turned to nine, turned to 12. And um, we decided as an organization that it was working and it was something that we wanted to adopt um, for kind of the business side of things and the uh, company management side of things. Um, later when I was on my second maternity leave, uh, sort of the unthinkable thing happened and we actually trialed it on a production, which <laughs> I didn't um, necessarily ever think we would get to that point, but it was something again that the team wanted to try. And Paul has spoken publicly about the benefits um, to the work that he's made from having the four day week in the rehearsal period. And um, people's productivity is a lot better. People are doing better work. They're less tired. We know that putting on a show can be really um, you know, intense and exhausting. And it's just allowed people to find um, balance within that process. Um, in terms of outcomes, uh, I mean, uh, Lizzie mentioned earlier about uh, childcare costs. So for people with care responsibilities, the four day week has a, has a really financial um, incentive in terms of making childcare affordable. Um, but it wasn't something that we put together specifically for people with caring commitments. And I think what I learned was that caring commitments need to be part of the conversation about access and inclusion sort of across the board. Um, the other outcome was that you can try stuff and pilot stuff. You don't always have to know the outcome when you start on something and you can give something a go. Um, and we also try to respond to feedback. So whilst we think of ourselves as a four day week organization and um, it doesn't work for everybody and we are first and foremost flexible. So where it doesn't work for people, we'll have a conversation with them about what they do need. And if that's spreading their hours over five days then that's absolutely fine. Um, the second thing that I wanted to talk to you about was uh, allocating a caring budget on a production. Um, so we've just recently piloted this on our Christmas show. Um, we had 500 pounds in the production budget allocated to caring commitments. And we had lots of conversations as a team uh, about this. Um, there were some anxieties, you know, was it enough money? What if lots of people asked for everything? Um, would it work? Was it fair? In the end, again, we decided to just give it a go. Um, and Paul, as director of the production, sent an email to the team saying, you know, these are all the things we do to support people with caring commitments. Um, but we've actually this time we've got this allocation of funds and if you need anything and you think that this might be able to support you um, during this process then please come and have a conversation with us on a case-by-case -case basis um, and that has supported things like transport and travel costs and um, childcare. Um, I guess the learnings from that uh, pilot were to take the team on the journey. Again, we didn't know the outcome when we started it and, it and 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 allowing people to fail and, you know, for things to go wrong and to respond to feedback is really important. Um, doing stuff, however small it may seem, is better than doing nothing. And there's not a one size fits all approach to these things. Um, different people need different things and will ask for different things. And equally, um, you know, personally, I've realized that people also need different things depending on where they are within those caring commitments. You know, as a, a, a pregnant person, I need something different to when my baby's arrived, to when my baby starts nursery and to the future when my children go to school. Um, the last sort of area I want to talk about was children at work. Um, so some really nice examples um, from other people, Deborah mentioned about um, having children in the work environment. Um, so again, we've always been sort of open to that and supported that. But most recently, um, our brilliant writer, Ellen Brammer, um, took her baby um, to R&D at the National Theatre in London, um, which was a really obviously significant undertaking, but really enriching process for everybody involved. And um, yeah, you know, we had to have lots of conversations and do the things we could do to support that. But I think, you know, the environment in which we were then making that work was really enhanced by having having the baby in the room. Um, and just on a personal level, I mean, I, when I was on maternity leave, I needed to attend a board meeting with my baby. And I'd done it with my first child, still feeling really stressed about it. And would it work? Um, you know, would I be able to juggle sitting in a board meeting with caring for my child? And I turned up, it was a board meeting in AGM. I turned up to work and uh, 
two or uh, other children were there with their parents um, who were company members. And I realized at that point that what we'd done is we'd created a culture where actually um, caring is part of what we do and people felt comfortable to bring their children into that situation. And immediately I kind of felt completely supported and um, a bit silly for worrying about it at all in the first place because you can do lots of stuff but you can also create the environment. And I think that's really important. And the advocacy around it as well, you know, for me as an individual, as a leader in the organization, the way that I carry myself and the things that I talk about and share, you know, that advocacy is really important in um, tackling some of these issues. Um, so I'm just keeping an eye on the time, <laughs> but I'll just bring it to a close, just a couple more sorts of things. So in terms of outcomes and business resilience, um, you know, like other people have said, Rob said, people are making better work because they feel supported and they can bring their full selves. Um, it protects middle child as an organisation from the talent drain, which is really significant um, when working in cities like Hull. And we really want to invest in retaining staff we have. And hopefully, you know, it means that freelancers want to come back and work with us again and again and actually become advocates for the company, which is a really powerful thing. My final point is, I think we're very good at understanding in other areas of access inclusion, that it shouldn't always be the people who will benefit from the change kind of making it. And I think we need to remember that caring is no different. Um, in our organisation, actually, I mean, we've joined HIPAA as a charter partner um, whilst I was on maternity leave. It's been an absolutely a game changer for us and huge amounts of support um, and brilliant work that the team do has really helped us. Um, but Paul, our artistic director, is actually the HIPAA champion in the organisation. And that was a really specific choice that it shouldn't necessarily be the people who were carrying the emotional labour of the situation who were championing the change and um, leading that forward in the organisation. Um, that's just a few of the things um, we've been doing. And um, please do get in touch if you want to. Um, we've, as I've said, we've got some brilliant resources on our website and we're always up for conversations um, with people. So, yeah. Thank you very much for having me and I'll hand back to you, Anna. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And I've already seen there's um, uh, a lot of interest in the four day week. Uh, I think we'll need a whole other session to, to take it apart. So we will we'll look into that. Um, but I just wanted to, to just say like how how trialing something is so is so, so useful and it's something we always encourage to do because committing to a big change can be very scary because there's so many unknown factors but when you trial something there is the opportunity um, to do it for a certain period of time to um, put the parameters in place to, to sort of see what the boundaries are and then to learn from it as well on the go and most of the time once something is trialed it's maybe adapted later on but actually is, is the first step to implementing. So um, well done on well done on taking sort of that approach of just trying it out and see if it works. Uh, because you know if it doesn't work, then you know better off than than you know um, than you were before. And I'm really I'm really conscious of time, uh, and I'm I'm very sorry we won't have time for for direct um, questions, even though there are a few in the Q and A. I will quickly hand you over um, to Metapa Hardcastle to just introduce one of our tools to you that we will be sharing afterwards. Um, Matt, I'm really sorry to not give you much time, but um, sorry. Uh, over to you. I can whiz through this, and if anyone's got any questions about it, send me an email sort of after uh, this. So, um, hi, I'm uh, Matt. I'm a white man in my 30s with brown hair and a beard, wearing a mustard-coloured shirt. I'm sat in front of a blurred-out light-coloured background. <laughs> Uh, so as part of the PIPA Charter Programme, we offer a toolkit to performing arts organisations of over 80 resources from case studies, how-to guides and sample policies. And I'd like to highlight one of our newest tools, which you'll have access to after this webinar, which can really feed into the inclusivity of your parent and carer workforce. Uh, this is our parent and carer access rider. And it's the more formal way of asking that question that Rob outlined earlier. What do you need to do your best? So an access rider is created to empower an organisation to effectively support and manage the individuals they're working with and empower an individual to access the support that they need. An access rider gives uh, individuals the opportunity to talk about aspects of their identity that they want the organisation to be aware of. 
Uh, we often hear from individuals that they are unsure of when to have the conversations around caring related needs and equally organisations saying we want to help but we aren't uh, sure how we inquire. This is why we would develop this tool and like all of our resources uh, it was created in consultation with freelancers and our partner organisations uh, with specific support actually from Birds of Paradise and Grey Eye. Um, so the process starts with an access requirements form, which you may be familiar with, especially when supporting staff with disabilities. Um, when engaging somebody new or in a new way, uh, the form offers prompts in such areas as communication, travel and scheduling so that access needs can be met. And not only that, but if it's completed before or during induction, access needs can be met in a timely and productive manner rather than when challenges arise. Uh, we've expanded on this form by including parenting carer specific examples to reassure that caring related needs can be discussed and that the organisation's ethos is welcoming of that. Uh, there's also an additional section at the end which remains open for a sort of catch-all opportunity to share information and we've seen people use this additional section uh, to inform uh, managers of their child moving schools or anniversaries of bereavements so again the correct support and work-life balance for these times uh, can be achieved. Uh, once this form is completed it's important that then it's acted upon. Uh, so this can take the form of a one-to-one -one catch up with follow-up actions, follow actions agreed, or with the creation of an access statement, which sort of summarizes the key uh, points. And that can be shared with all the relevant uh, people uh, connected to that project or production. Uh, this can be revisited if circumstances change on an annual basis or sort of when a freelancer returns uh, to your organisation after some time away. It not only demonstrates that your organisation is inclusive of parents and carers, but it also uh, becomes time and resource efficient. It's really time and energy consuming to have to constantly go through your access needs from scratch, especially for freelancers who might work on multiple projects with you. So creating a record of support which stays with that individual. And the more that this happens, the more that organisations develop a bank of knowledge of how people can be supported. Uh, so we have a word form, uh, which we will share with you after this, but many organisations that we work with have developed it into a Google or a Microsoft form or similar, so that it becomes a really easy um, form just to send out and collate uh, responses. Now, I'm not saying that uh, this tool is sort of the answer to everything, but what it does do is it demonstrates the approach of how your organisation can remain inclusive and relevant to those that. Um, you work with and I just want to highlight that quite quickly. Um, so communication from all of our speakers, um, as you'll, I'm sure you'll agree, is a central asset to inclusion. So by being ready with strong pieces of communication that invite conversations around caring responsibilities immediately demonstrates your family friendly ethos. Uh, this open communication right from the outset should not only build positive relationships with new people coming into your organisation, but also support them to bring their best. We know of many parents and carers who have put so much energy into hiding their caring responsibilities at work or worrying about when to bring it up. So over a sustained period of time, this can impact productivity and job satisfaction and retention. Um, if clear and strong methods of communication are not in place, often organisations only find out about an access requirement when an emergency arises. This can mean that individual, the individual in question feels they're in a vulnerable position, and that the organisation has to be reactive with their response, which can be stressful, ineffective, and it can often tarnish the thought of offering that type of support again. So knowing someone's access needs well in advance and having a plan for how to support them means that the ways of working are pre-agreed and the best way forward is identified. Um, just lastly, the, the more that we, and it sort of goes with what Lindsay was saying, the more that we try, the more that we know what is possible. Putting a new support in place to meet someone's access needs might be a challenge or might not work fully the first time around, but if it's trialled, reflected on, the next time that the, that support is requested, it means that you're more prepared for it. And again, that means that you're on the front foot of being inclusive and relevant, and so the cycle continues. 
I'll hand over to Anna, but again, any uh, questions about the charter programme, the resources that we have, or questions about this access rider, just get in touch afterwards. Thank you, Matt. That was a true whistle stop tour. Um, uh, I'm Oh, I'm trying to stop. There we go. Stop share. Um, so I just want to say thank you. I'm, I'm really sorry we run over a little bit. Um, we obviously try to fill a lot in very little time. This is good learning for us. But I want to say thank you to all of our speakers um, for sharing their insights. Uh, and thank you um, to you guys for attending as well. Uh, if you have any questions, um, please, please email us. Um, the email is 